Welcome to Zorp's engineering video series. Uh, we have Neil Davis with us today. Neil is a computer scientist working on solid state computing and languages. He's developing the Jock programming language at Zorp for the NOC ecosystem. Welcome, Neil. Thanks for having me on. I've been asked to talk today about the tokenomics of NOC chain and um, what's going on with the issuance and uh, the economic model that underlies the incentives that have been set up with this blockchain. So for some background, Knockchain is a new proof of work blockchain that unlocks the power of cheap, provable knock based computation for the world. Uh, knock being a combinator calculus uh, that essentially gives you a minimal set of computing um, expressions and tools in order to reason about and express the uh, operations and expressions that you're you're pursuing. Knockchain is a blockchain that will use zero knowledge proofs to enable programmability and scalability while remaining trustless and decentralized. So we're trying to capture a lot of these desirable properties of blockchains in doing this. Knockchain has the original cypherpunk proof of work incentives while making use of modern research into zero knowledge proofs, data availability, and scalability on the chain. So in this discussion, we want to talk about the tokenomics of NOC chain and what you'll be able to do with the NOC token. Now, why do we use blockchains at all? Blockchains provide a way for us to, to store, send, and issue assets securely without trusting any third parties. So generally, we're interested in on-chain settlement. And here we're talking about an attestation of the truth of the history of state transitions of the chain. How did the chain get to where it is? Why is this consistent and dependent on the path that brought it to this point? The history of events. We're interested in on-chain execution in some form. Knock chain is pretty lean in this regard. Uh, different chains have made different decisions about that, but this is something that most blockchains are interested in providing on-chain data storage and temporary blob data availability. So a blob here is something like a file or a knock noun. It just means that we're referring to some data without at this point making any claims about the type of data uh, that it is. Parts of these uses can be pushed off of the chain or at least left outside of the consensus conditions depending on the design of the system. The knock chain protocol incentivizes fast and cheap knock proving through a proof of work competition. We want proofs to be as cheap as possible. So to that end, let's talk about the token model that is in play on knock chain. Now, the knock chain vision is that we're going to have scalable off chain apps to post data and proofs on chain for cheap, secure settlement. So there's going to be a native coin, which is a knock. This is going to have a hard capped supply. Uh, that's going to be used to pay for settlement execution, data storage, and temporary data availability. Knocks are going to be acquired through mining or through markets. Uh, as with a conventional blockchain, transaction creators will set fees. Miners will receive those fees when they incorporate the transaction into a mined block successfully. Knock is not a utility coin for making proofs or doing on-chain execution. It's not like gas. Users pay miners fees by transaction weight like Bitcoin with said transaction fees paying for on-chain storage, on-chain execution, which Knockchain keeps minimal, and temporary blob data storage. So the fundamental, uh, excuse me, the fungible token on Knockchain is a knock. And so colloquially, you know, we can say a buck knock or a knock token or a knock coin. We're just gonna call it a knock here, uh, which does have some ambiguity with the name of the language, which is knock. These are subdividable into two to the 16th components or NICs, and then the total supply here is a little more than 4 billion is 2 to the 32 NOCs. That means that the NOC token is hard capped and deflationary. The issuance curve uh, describes how tokens become available over time. So here we can see uh, the NOC chain has earlier eons being weighted more heavily for blocks. And then the time span of each E on these, each uh, period of issuance uh, at, a, at a particular block reward gradually extending towards a maximum span. We can compare this issuance curve um, with Bitcoin in this case. 
we are a little bit steeper at the beginning than Bitcoin because we are trying to incentivize software optimization over hardware farming. So you can see that relative to knock chain, Bitcoin is biased towards commoditization of hardware rather than optimization of software. Now, there was no pre-mine on Knockchain, which means that Knockchain began as a fair launch uh, when the open source reference miner was released a few weeks back before launch. The world was able to compete in optimizing for competitive software execution. The chain's token issuance schedule is designed to enable Knockchain's goal of private, scalable, decentralized, verifiable computation. Uh, the incentives are set in place for software evolution to beat brute hardware, particularly in the early stages. That's why we're steeper on the left-hand side of this chart in the first few block months here. Uh, this, this vision of software competition, software evolution, beating brute hardware, uh, applies both through NOC as a single-threaded solid-state computing platform and the token issuance schedule that NOC chain has baked into it. Early movers are going to have an advantage in capitalization, but by the end of the first few eons, the network will support a massive proof rate and Noctane will serve as the proving standard for the entire world, is our objective. Now, a moment ago, I used the term eon to refer to a period during the issuance schedule when the block reward is a certain size. So that's one of these, these uh, bars here is, is what those represent. Um, as a matter of terminology, we're gonna distinguish an issuance eon from an epoch where an epoch refers to a period of fixed proof of work puzzle difficulty. And so epochs will continue to change. Uh, the initial version of Knockchain targets a 10 minute block time on average. So at the end of two block weeks, the algorithm is automatically going to recalculate the puzzle difficulty to dial it up or down according to the proof power being exercised on the network at that time. So circling back around, what are Knox actually good for? So we said NOx are going to pay for, uh, you know, they're going to pay miners for transaction fees. What, what does that mean? What are we doing with transaction fees? So we're going to pay primarily for space in NOC chain's namespace. Uh, it's going to pay for on-chain data storage and temporary data availability. NOC chain is not designed to support heavyweight on-chain execution of computation. So this means that we're not treating the NOC token as a, a gas-like uh, calculation. It's, it's a transaction fee to miners, not, not an Ethereum like gas. This focus is so that knock chain becomes a high throughput chain for posting verifiable proofs and storing data. So what in this case is a proof? What are we talking about? And what are we posting as transactions on the chain? So at the beginning, during what we'll call dumbnet, Knock chain transactions correspond to transfers of NOX and simple Bitcoin-like multi-sigs and atomic swaps. So each block is going to have a header, a nonce, uh, the kinds of things that you're used to seeing, uh, and some collection of transactions, which can be, you know, um, exchanges of NOC. It can be utilization of registrations in the namespace. Uh, it can be general purpose NOC proofs and, and putting these things together as a standard set of transactions encoded into a block. At the next stage, an chain is gonna be outfitted with a namespace for addressing data. We're gonna start with posted blobs or generic data. You can think of these as files, like I said, but they're more generally knock nouns, which can include bit arrays. Knock chain's final mature form will be a system for posting proofs of, for off-chain verifiable computations. We refer to this model as lightweight trustless settlement of heavyweight verifiable computation. Verifiability of the computations is not supplied via public replication, but instead by means of private proofs which are reproducible and verifiable by those who need to. Proofs are produced off chain, but the verification takes place on chain. Running a light node should be straightforward because of this. This is why when we talk about the mining power available on the network, we refer to proof power rather than hash power. Proof power means the available commoditized verifiable computation based on zero knowledge proving. We call the compute power commoditized because the heavyweight computation does not need to be done on the distributed consensus blockchain. Only a proof of the computation needs to be posted. So you can trustlessly use state which has been verified correct you know, within the past few blocks 
you know, so assuming that you don't have a reorganization without necessitating the entire history of the chain. The chain can be proven to be consistent at a particular block height uh, because ultimately this is what you want to be able to do with knock chain. You want a zero knowledge proof of work chain. ZKPOW creates a consensus reality for all of the participants in the network. They must agree on the protocol, the sequence of time and so forth. And in exchange for that agreement, that consensus reality, they can permissionlessly develop mine and homestead, as it were, the unlocked knock chain territory. ZKPOW means forging a privacy preserving consensus for human interactions and communities, AI interactions and communities, whatever you want to build that interacts with this chain. Um, but the target is that it's going to be free from centralized platforms and bureaucracies, and the emphasis is going to be more on privacy, lightweight, provable computation, and only exposing the kinds of data that you want to expose when you engage in transactions on this network. Oh, awesome. I was I was so wrapped up, Neil. I was like, I'm learning more about Knockchain than I ever have. <laughs> um, this is really fascinating uh, to hear to hear this. And and um, I, I'm Casimir. I, I work with Neil here at Zorp. Um, and so I've I've been inside, you know, uh, the sausage factory watching it being made. But um, having this laid out is is really helpful. One uh, question on the issuance schedule, like you said, Knockchain's issuance is a steeper curve that also goes to an asymptote like Bitcoin's. Yeah, and so this you you indicated, maybe you could um, explain it. You know, like I'm five. Our sharper uh, issuance, which is higher at the beginning, incentivizes software optimization. What's the reason that that curve indicates that? So there are a few economic and technical factors that play into this. One of them is that hardware has a long lead time. So, you know, Bitcoin ran through this cycle of early on, people could mine on CPUs and you have stories of people, you know, mining in their computer labs at their school. And over time, the, the Bitcoin mining algorithm got pushed to more and more specialized hardware. You had the, the ASICs, the application specific integrated circuits and so forth. And Bitcoin mining is really completely dominated now by mining farms. It's permissionless in the sense that anyone can participate in it, but it's not really enabled strictly by software to be competitive in Bitcoin mining you really have to have access to specialized hardware that can run the exact hash algorithm that Bitcoin is built around. So those things have a long lead time, you know, the, the development of this, whereas people who are able to understand the algorithm, who are able to understand the code and move relatively quickly towards uh, actually creating implementations uh, and exploring techniques for solving the knock algorithms uh, are going to have an advantage in this space because you can iterate software faster than you can iterate hardware. Yeah. And, and Neil, we've seen that, uh, haven't we, with, with both the open source mining um, optimization efforts, but then also we know there's multiple closed source people optimizing and winning blocks already early on, right? Right. Yeah, that's that's fascinating to me. It makes total sense. And actually, I have a I have a bit axe, um, small Bitcoin miner or hasher uh, running right over here. You know, so to it's your like point, lot lottery box tier. Uh... <laughs> it is. It is a lottery box. It's one. One. I should win a block every twenty thousand years. Um, there with, with that, so I won't hold my breath. Well. Um, Neil, thank you for, for sharing this. This was fascinating. I look forward to talking for our next video. All right. Thank you.